Welcome again, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. Uh, as always, if you support these videos, you can head over to patreon.com slash AKSUM or join the YouTube channel directly. Today, we have with us the great Scott Horton, who I had the pleasure of uh, meeting a few years ago, although I, I doubt he remembers it, during a book signing when he came to the State House in lovely Los Angeles, California. Welcome to the program, Scott. Hi, how's it going? Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's uh, a number of things you have in, in L.A., and maybe we could even drop the radio station later for people and we make sure to, to plug everything. But I think I'd, I want to start a little uh, big picture before we jump into Afghanistan, which is obviously the, the big topic of the day. And uh, your stuff is always uh, evergreen. It happens to be topical, too, at the moment. But I remember you and I chatting because I was at the time a few years ago a Lyft driver, and you were telling me about how you used to be a taxi driver. And I'm I'm wondering if you could talk because I have a, a number of Ethiopians in the audience, but also non-Ethiopians, and I think there's something to do with the uh, the field of like, you know, carrying people in your own car that has some sort of independent or liberty mindset. And I think there's some connection there, but I don't know if it's ever been fleshed out between how you got into your anti-war work uh, as, as well as how you were a driver back in the day. Hmm. Well, at least in my days um, in Austin, it was not so much an Ethiopian thing as Nigerians. Although there's, if you ask them, there's like four or five different kinds of Nigerians. And then they, <laughs> you know, had their little sects and things. Uh, but uh no, man. Uh, yeah, I love being a cab driver. And yeah, it is a, you know, I'm a skateboarder too. So, you know, it's, um, it's an individual kind of thing, but you do it with your friends kind mm -hmm. of, deal, but it's still, you know, it's all up to you and, uh, it's individual based type thing. And plus I'm a pothead. So I want to, you know, <laughs> I want to work at an office or <laughs> some kind of thing like that. So, and this is my town, you know, Austin. And, um, so as a cab driver, I'm not actually sure. Let's see from, I guess I was a cab driver for about eight years, seven, eight years, something like that, from the late 90s to the or late mid 90s, 97 or so through about 2005. It's about eight years. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it was great, man. Really great times and set your own schedule and um, stay broke, but <laughs> stay full, right? There's always a drive through. And so uh, make lease and ride skateboards and you know, be happy. Yeah, it's good time. So, how 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 did you get to? Because I think a lot of of people are still, um, you know, trying to find their niche. And obviously, you know, you have time after time again emphasized how you know war stuck out to you as kind of the the greatest harm that the state does. So that's that's the thing that caught your eye, and you stayed laser focused on there and. You could gather anyone from libertarians to pinkos together to agree on that on that subject, and mm -hmm. you did that for years with Justin Raimondo and and all the other great folks there at antiwar.com. But how how did you go from kind of maybe I don't know if you had it as a side hustle or a side project at the time where you got to go like full blown every day? This is what I'm I'm doing. Um. Well, let's see. I mean, I started doing a radio show like a weekly show on free radio Austin in 98. And then I had a show on chaos radio starting, I think at the very beginning in 92, I'm pretty sure is when we went on the air with chaos. And then, um, so that was like doing, you know, a weekly show still kind of driving a cab and all that. And then in 2005, I guess, let's see in 2004, I created the bumper sticker.com with my friend. Nice. Tracy. But then you know, the deal was I was just going to make up anti-government slogans because I drove for a living. So I was always thinking, man, I wish I had a bumper sticker that said this or that or the other thing on it. Right. So my job was to make up the anti-government propaganda and his job was to run the company. But then he had to move away to take care of family problems and things like that. So we sold the company to uh, Rick McGinnis, who still owns it to this day, um, libertystickers.com and the bumper sticker.com. And, uh, and so then right around that time was when I quit driving the cab and started working for antiwar.com. Uh, I would say part-time, but somehow I barely, you know, got by. And then, you know, um, really, you know, started selling ads for the show, posting on the, well, by 2003, 
I started posting my show on the internet. You know, I was the first podcaster before there was an RSS feed. And then I was the last one to get an RSS feed, you know, because I'm the, so inept at this stuff. But uh, so I was posting the, and at some point I started trying to sell ads and all that and make a little bit of money from the show. And uh, antiwar.com was paying me just enough to keep the lights on. And so, you know, I guess that started about 2005. Oh, I guess the Daily Show, actually, when I really got, when they really hired me full time was in at the beginning of 07 was when I started doing the Daily Show. So through 06, I don't know what the hell the hell I was making money in 06. I was delivering flowers and delivering sandwiches. So I quit driving a cab in 05. So I think in 06, I was um, delivering sandwiches. I hated that job. Jason's <laughs> deli. And uh, really, really cool flower shop, though. I worked for this. I can't remember who it was. This really nice lady and the other guy. Um. And uh, and then 2007 is when I started working for antiwar.com full time. And then I'm kind of only on part time for them now because I have less direct responsibilities for them now. Mm -hmm. um, because you have the Libertarian uh, Institute now. Yeah. And then, you know, I have the Institute and then, you know, I'm trying to sell books and I try to sell ads and collect donors to the show and all these different, you know, things, ways of trying to make a little bit of money. Just to yeah. to, again, keep the lights on is enough for me now. I'll have to hit the Bitcoin lottery someday <laughs> if I'm going to ever have a pension. <laughs> and and I and I hope you do. And it was when I had met you, it was a book signing for Fool's Errand. And I don't recall if it was it was either Dr. Ron Paul in you know the end of End of Fed. I think he mentioned you um, and maybe antiwar.com alongside Mises.org and, and Lou Rockwell. It was either that or through Tom Woods Radio that I, I first came upon your work but i don't even remember how but then you became ubiquitous and you would make the rounds on thaddeus russell on dave smith on on everyone's on with your own institute as as well and uh um you know everyone keeps itching for that message to go out more and more but it's fascinating that that uh there's this kind of uh this blending in the um the radio space to the to the podcasting space which kind of deserves its its own discussion for another another time but yeah you you've been in here from the beginning and and there are a few people who kind of went radio only and then there are the people who made the the transition to the the podcasting space we are in los angeles uh, at least where i'm broadcasting from yeah. so i think it's good to uh, to shout out now before we kind of uh, move forward what do you do with the kpfk at, at 90.7 I've, I've heard you a few times on there although I, I probably listen to you way more on on youtube and on the podcast well so i lived out in la for a couple of years in 2009 through 11 and uh while I was there, I got a show on KPFK and then I decided to, you know, move home and get married and all that stuff. So, uh, but I got to keep my show. So the show is anti-war radio it was on Friday nights for a few years, but uh, mm -hmm. now it's on Sunday mornings at eight 30 Pacific time. And essentially I give them the best interview of the week or the most half hourist interview of the week to fit in there, you know? Um, and you know, I'm really, I don't know if, you know, how they look at this, but I'm really not a sectarian at all. You know, I probably, mm -hmm. if you count it up, I bet a super majority even of my guests are liberals and leftists, uh, you know, because they're just journalists covering the wars and yeah, they're just, you know, mostly not libertarian types. Um, but, you know, mostly the subject matter is just so narrow that partisanship doesn't really have anything to do with it right like if the israelis forged the smoking laptop to implicate the iranians and having a secret nuclear weapons program then that's kind of you know on or off up or down black or white kind of an issue rather than left or right kind of an issue and you could even be really pro-zionist and be like oh the germans admitted they got it from the mek huh well all right <laughs> you know i don't know <laughs> it yeah, is no, what I it is <clears throat> so does it does you know it what? matter really, oh i'm sorry go ahead oh no go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say i didn't really answer your question about you know how i got stuck like this i think you know just very briefly when i was a teenager in the 90s uh i was you know maybe this is part of being from austin texas and and really right at the edge of the travis county line where there's very much a liberal and leftist influence and there's very mm -hmm. much a right-wing conservative influence 
in uh you know growing up around here and some of us come out hardcore libertarians others become total fascists horrible and everything right but um you know there are a lot of right-wing hippies here and there are a lot of you know uh gun-toting leftists and you know there's <laughs> you know there's a lot of kind of weird mixes and things so one of yeah. my things was i was raised on you know uh the reagan administration committing war crimes down in el salvador and nicaragua and you know illegally selling weapons to the ayatollah to finance death squads in nicaragua that congress wouldn't give them the money to do and this kind of thing and even you know uh going so far as oliver north and all those guys pushing mm -hmm. dope in la to help pay for it all and I, you know i learned about that i don't know when i first learned about i mean obviously wrong contra but even going so far as like the reaganites being the cocaine supply during that time of the crack epidemic and the drug wars or the crackdown against it and all of that in the you know second half of the 80s essentially early 90s <clears throat> i'm not sure when i learned that but i learned that very young and i paid attention when the when the gary webb uh series first came out uh in the san jose mercury news which would have been in what like 91 or something like that and waco happened but mm -hmm. it was the democrats who did it so it's all, and they blamed all right wingers. So it was like radical right wingers who the ones who were who cared about. Oh no, that was Oklahoma. I'm, I'm complaining too. Because first of all, Waco happened. It was the right wingers who cared about the Davidians. Then Oklahoma City happened, and all the right wingers got blamed for that. So it was there in their interest to, um, you know, really focus on who all was behind that. And it was true. It was the radical right, but it was the very, very, very radical right Aryan Republican Army neo Nazis not just every last militia guy from Michigan, like in the narrative, who did that thing. And then they covered it up and they let them all get away with it. Um, and uh, mostly because they were all, uh, the guys who did it were guilty. Uh, the, the guilty involved in the plot were FBI informants and flip states mm -hmm. witnesses and so forth. So it would have been embarrassing for them to admit how they could have, should have stopped the attack if they'd been doing their job uh, and watching their own, you know, rats. Um, who did this under their nose, essentially. Um, but anyway, so then I have, so there's, you know, and, and I guess I, I should also not leave out, I have this leftist um, uh, history teacher in high school who taught us all about the CIA and, you know, all the overthrows in Iran and Guatemala and Chile and all of that stuff, but also taught us about central banking. It's pretty good for a leftist talk to, you know, about inflationary money and all of this yeah. stuff. Like not that she was an Austrian, but at least she taught us about, you know, this is not all above board necessarily, you know, how Kucinich would have been in the same boat. I was uh, working for Kucinich in fall of 2011 as a legislative intern, and he was inviting Peter Schiff to talk to him about oh, the really? Fed because he's friends with Ron Paul. Very interesting. Right. So, so I had, you know, a little bit of like Chomsky, when I was the first Chomsky I read, might've been in high school, but then. I also was really interested in all this John Burt Society, New World Order conspiracy mm -hmm. theory stuff. Because like all Bill Clinton and Al Gore, you know, they had bodies came home from Korea and Al Gore, you know, greeted them at the airport and they're all draped in UN flags. It's like, oh, see, it's the one world government and all this. <laughs> but so one of the keys to the one world government, New World Order conspiracy theory, at least as told by like its very smartest proponents, like there was a guy named Guru Das who wrote a good book about it. And of course, William Norman Grigg at the New American Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and before him, uh, G. Edward Griffin, the guy that wrote uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island. So here are these guys, especially Griffin. Like here's a, a very like, if I say John Burt Society, you picture Griffin, right? This like 1950s caricature, right-wing anti-communist hardcore you know christian american george washington worshiping nationalist you know guy and yet hardcore anti-war and why it ain't because he's a hippie right it's because he sees the american empire as all the evil secret commie illuminati plot to destroy the united states that that's the only way to destroy the united states is through imperial overextension and debt and running our military into the ground and all this stuff. Now, this is all a bunch of crap, basically. But the point is, he's still right anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And then it just so happens that it was actually Will Grigg in the New American Magazine that after September 11th, when 
my first thought was probably the CIA did this, which I don't really think that anymore, but I did think that I was like a truther before it ever happened kind of a thing. So it kind of fit into my prediction of what was going to happen. But I also thought, you know, secondly, well, look, if it really was just bin Laden and his guys who did this and they thought they were fighting against the empire by doing it. Well, they're damn fools, right? Because they just kicked our empire in the pants. They just gave W. Bush and Dick Cheney the opportunity to do whatever they want now, like go to Afghanistan and Iraq. But it was just a couple months later. I'm pretty sure it was November of 01 that William Norman Grigg wrote this giant thing all about terrorism in the New American magazine and explaining how what they've been trying to do through the 1990s with all their attacks on the embassies and the coal and all this stuff was to try to get us to react and invade Afghanistan in asymmetric political action like terrorism. The action is in the reaction of the opposition. Why did the Birchers know that? Because they were reading the communists because they were such anti-communists, but they were reading like Saul Alinsky is where that <laughs> phrase comes from. Uh, the, radical. the action is in the reaction of the opposition, right? So in other words, you take your one world commie, new world order, United Nations conspiracy theory thing about how the reason that our government keeps us at war all the time is because they're evil traitors who are trying to destroy America. But you just take that same lesson about how destructive, self, how self-destructive foreign war is for mm -hmm. the United States. And then you look at how Osama bin Laden was playing that same game. And he really was. And of course, the joke is, it was the game that America had helped the bin Ladenites wage against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the 1980s for the deliberate purpose of giving them their own Vietnam, which meant a horrible long-term no-win quagmire that breaks the bank and screws up your country back home and destabilizes everything and ruins everything. We were trying to do that to the Soviets, succeeded in doing that to the Soviets, in helping bin Laden and his people help the Afghan Mujahideen to do so. And then now we're doing the same thing to ourselves again anyway. And so it was so. And then right at that time, actually, that uh, right after September 11th, really, was when I finally got the Internet. because so I was always just reading books and newspapers and and, you know, dial up and DSL and all this. It just wasn't worth the money and the hassle for me at the time. I just didn't have it, the interest in it. And also because I was such a New World Order kook. The whole thing to me was the NSA plot to spy on us all from the very like ground up anyway, right? So I just I just stayed away from it. But I knew about antiwar.com and I had read it a bit in 99 during Kosovo. And so then after September 11th, I started reading antiwar.com all the time. And then as you mentioned, Justin Romando. And why was it that Justin Romando didn't have time for all this new world order crap? Because that was a bunch of crap. And he was, you know, of course he knew all about that stuff. But that was all ancient history and it had nothing to do with what was going on. And when he described what was going on, it wasn't the Council on Foreign Relations that was the center of everything, like in the New World Order kooks. It was AEI and PNAC and WINEP and JINSA. And that's different, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and this was so I I um, and and Cheney, I'll tell you what it was too. one more rant. I went to a Ron Paul Republicans meeting to try to get rid of some bumper stickers. Uh -huh. I don't think I sold very many and I don't think they liked me very much, but there was a guy there <clears throat> who said he loved Ron Paul on everything, everything except foreign policy. His foreign policy was that the USA should kill every single Arab and Muslim in the whole world until they're all dead. And then that'll solve that problem mm -hmm. once and for all. And Ron Paul's wrong about that, but on everything else, limited government, free markets, and guns, and well, oh, great guy, good old Ron. But on the on the genocide thing, because one American baby is worth the life of every Muslim in the world combined, or some kind of thing. But anyway, so this same jerk explains to me that I'm an idiot with all this one world government crap, and that he says that he's been traveling with the Bush people. He was a part of the campaign. And he said he met Dick Cheney numerous times. He knew Karl Rove. And Connolly's a rice might be a member of the Council on Foreign Relations or something, but that doesn't mean anything, dude. Dick Cheney is not a one-worlder. Or if he is, he thinks that he ought to be the king of it all. And the idea that this is all, that whatever 
he's doing as part of some agenda to empower Brussels over the U.S. or to empower New York City over D.C., you know, the U.N. headquarters, Security Council, somehow over the United States. That's just not true. It's a bunch of dated old conspiracy crap that don't hold up no more. And and then, you know, look, they they pushed Elias right into war with Iraq. And my prediction was they're going to make a deal with the Russians and the French that you guys get the Kurdish oil and we'll get the oil down in the South, something like that, so that it would be a big baby blue flag UN war. Well, that's just not what it was at all, was it? And George Bush's whole thing about the United Nations and the New World, George Bush Sr.'s mm -hmm. whole thing from, a, you know, 1990 and 91 about the United Nations and the New World Order and whatever apparently had nothing to do with what Dick Cheney had and the neoconservatives had in mind at all. It just didn't. And so that was when I quit being a New World Order cook was like in 02 in the run up to Iraq War II. Like, OK, I'm wrong about this. Thought I was right, but I wasn't. And you know what? I should have known better in 99 when they bombed the hell out of Serbia to break off Kosovo over Russia's dead body. Now, how are you going to have a new world order and bring Russia into NATO and have this one world army and all of this stuff if you're willing to break a relationship with Russia over freaking Kosovo? You know, I, I really should have got a clue back then, but I thought I was smart and I wasn't. Yeah, that's where push comes to shove, where it's like, you know, are, is it super coherent and evil or is it, you know, there's some level of chaos behind what's going on and they're just not communicating. So the, the real issue is that, that there's nobody really in charge, not that everybody right. is, you know, in charge together. It, right. It's so funny. You started uh, earlier. You're a little older than me, um, but I was a teenager and I came upon the, the same kind of weird confluences. I don't know if it's because I grew up in left and progressive L.A., but at the same time had these culturally conservative Orthodox, uh, you know, Christian family coming from uh, Ethiopia that had this uh, maybe the same confluence, but the reverse of Austin being the the blue dot in the in the red state. So at that time in 2004, I was listening to Immortal Technique. At the, and later that year, after I had listened to Immortal Technique, I was listening to Alex Jones in 2004. So I was getting the the twin <laughs> kind of the 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 polar opposites in terms of presentation of how they would criticize it, but they would be criticizing the same thing from these different angles you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I started college in 2008, and I I did four years of rugby. My uh, we had we went to a Christian school, uh, Pepperdine, and our our rugby uh, we had a prayer leader. Our prayer leader was from the John Birch Society, and he would give me John Birch Society magazines. So I'm reading John Birch magazine. I'm, I'm listening to Immortal Technique. Uh, I I kind of stopped listening to to Jones for a little bit. I, I went in and out because it got too much for me at times. But then that's also the moment in which I start seeing Ron Paul and start reading his books and and following all the woodworks. To getting to you in fact um much more recently your your wife's work whom you mentioned earlier the the 28 pages explained is probably the most recent time i've delved into the conspiracies because let people just search her work uh the 28 pages explained and, and read those actual redacted pages and and see what's up with bandar bush and something is fishy something's rotten there you know I, it doesn't mean that all the dots are connected in a particular way but there's something about that that story that is not right i don't know if there's anything i know it's not your work but if there's anything about the the 28 pages you wanted to say well yeah and people can find that antiwar.com it's larissa alexandrovna horton and um you know essentially what it is she knew so much about this when they finally released the 28 pages she kind of went through it but then also said, here's what we already knew. And here's what this either confirms or sheds light on or, you know, elaborates on. And the thing is, it's still not really conclusive that, okay, Prince Bandar is behind the 9-11 attack or something like that. But you do have a lot of weird stuff where Saudi intelligence is paying these guys and, you know, paying for their room and board and for their education, including in flight schools and all the rest of this stuff, evidently. I'd have to go back and look at all the details now. Um, but I think, <clears throat> you know, there are, I don't remember exactly how she ends. I think she ends it with a lot of unanswered questions that still remain. I think, you know, people want to jump to to vast conclusions 
first. But I think, you know, the minimal explanation here, well, there are a few different ones, but I guess to me, the most likely explanation is that the CIA was trying to work with the Saudis to recruit and flip at least the two guys in the San Diego cell that had come from the Malaysia meeting and gone to Bangkok and then landed in San Diego or LAX and then gone to San Diego. Um, and, and, and then it seems like at some point they abandoned the operation. They abandoned the attempt. Maybe it already, you know, they had tried to recruit the guys and it failed, but then they just dropped it. And then, so what they should have done at that time was kick the FBI, you know, really hard and said, you guys got to clean up this mess that we created here. We got these guys running around loose. Instead, it was just kind of like, oh, well, hope that goes away. It seems like, you know, there's an interview by Ray Noel Lesky. I always say it wrong. I'm sorry, Ray. Uh, he wrote a book about it and he did the Rich Blee podcast one and two. I can never find part two anymore. But Rich Blee was the CIA guy in charge of Alex Station at the time, I believe. And so Ray goes and interviews Richard Clark, who is in the White House. And he presents all this information about what Alex Station knew about the guys in San Diego. And Clark, I mean, who knows if he's being honest or not. He seems to be being honest when he says, man, that tenant, like, this is kind of unbelievable to me, man, because honestly, like me and tenant would stay up till two and three in the morning talking on the phone about this stuff. Like, we're obsessed with this stuff. Now I'm the, you know, he's the White House uh, terrorism coordinator, counterterrorism, whatever the hell. And he's talking with tenant constantly. And he says, tenant never told me any of this stuff. He kept me out of the loop on all of this stuff. And he says, the only explanation that I can think of would be that they had us, that they were trying to recruit these guys to be double agents inside Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And then they dropped the ball on it. You know, something like that, which sounds like some cop stuff. You know, by the way, um, just the other day, I don't think my guy has posted it yet. Um, but maybe by the time this is posted, it'll be up. Uh, I did an interview with Colleen Rowley, who was the, uh, FBI lawyer in Minneapolis, whose team had arrested Zacharias Musawi and had wanted to search his computer, get a FISA warrant to search his computer and the rest and were denied. And, you know, quite apparently, once they did search his computer, they had ties straight back to the hijackers in Florida. Um, for a while, they called this guy the 20th hijacker, but I don't think that's really right. I think he's here for something else later, but he was tied directly to these guys. And, um, uh, so I talked to her about this stuff and she says, you know, I can't remember if she's talking specifically about her exact situation or if she was kind of being more metaphorical about, you know, how this always is. I think she was saying in her own situation, like they had sent all this stuff to headquarters and the guy didn't check his email mm. or he checked it and he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about Minneapolis, whatever, let's go drinking. And then that's it. And there's like your point of failure is some meathead cop who didn't look carefully at something really urgent that came in. And then the way she tells it, yeah, that's how it goes, man. You know, that's the FBI on their best day. Is, <laughs> yeah, we got this guy who wants to learn how to fly a plane, but he doesn't seem to care how to take off or land it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we're going drinking. <laughs> Whatever, you know. And you could... And we, I, I talked with her for quite a while about this. And I really think, you know, I could definitely see where like people who are committed truthers would think of this as a limited hangout. But I think it's really right that essentially the CIA and the FBI and the NSA and all their bosses and all their middle managers and all their people, they're basically scum. They're mm -hmm. basically a bunch of, you know, meathead idiots who could be your deputy sheriff, but instead they're a supervisor at the FBI. But what makes them qualified to be super cop, like on some TV show where these guys actually do their job all day? Nah, they just, nothing. Nothing makes them that. And she put to me, she goes, look, all the best cops, they want to be cops. It's all the Peter Principal scumbag retards who want to go and be middle managers and senior managers at FBI headquarters in D.C. Can you imagine you join the FBI just to go to be some manager in D.C.? You join the FBI, you want to be Mulder and Scully out there kicking ass, right? 
you know, be a field agent cracking cases, man, saving lives. These guys who want to be managers, yeah, they're the kinds of people who want to be managers. You ever had to deal with people who want to be managers? You know, it's like having a boss. You ever had a boss who doesn't listen very well? Yeah, well, that's pretty much how they go. And 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 you do have such a separation of powers for good reason in a way, but it does mean that they just step on each other's toes and get in each other's way and hate each other for it. And famously, um, I don't know how famous, you can find this clip of Michael Scheuer, the former chief of the CIA's bin Laden unit, testifying before the Congress. And the congressman asks him about John O'Neill, who is the FBI head of counterterrorism. And Scheuer says, when that building came down on John O'Neill's head that day, that was the only good thing that happened to America oh, on the 11th of September. <laughs> like, that's all he wanted to see was a 110-story skyscraper crush John O'Neill to death. That dirty SOB whose fault this all was, according to Michael Scheuer. He could have called in a drone strike on FBI headquarters to get these guys out of his way. That's what he would have done. And I'm sure that's how the guys at the FBI felt about the CIA on the issue, too. You know? So. And you can tell he meant it, too. That guy, Sawyer, you say a lot of things about him. But a lot of things. But all of them include straight shooter, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this guy, you watch that clip, he clearly is absolutely seething with rage. This is no limited hangout. This is, this is what happened. There's an attack coming, and these, you know, idiots hate each other. You know, I saw an episode one time of some old thing on the Learning Channel or whatever about firefighters in Colorado, and they're on this hillside fighting a fire, and there's, I think they were both federal agencies. I think one was like the Parks Department, and the other was a different part of the Department of the Interior or something. I think they were both federal agencies. It could have been one was state and one was federal. But I think it was even both. I think it was separate federal agencies. And they were just down the highway from each other, a few miles. And these guys knew that the weather changed. And there was a, wind, a shift in the wind coming. And that these firefighters on the hillside were going to be in jeopardy. And then they're like, screw those guys, man. Wow. They wouldn't tell us. We hate them. And then they didn't tell them. And then the wind shifted and all the firefighters were burned to death. Because, yeah, exactly. Like, that's how the towers fell down. You know? You know how did the towers fall down? Well, a bunch of government employees were in charge of protecting it. <laughs> that's how. You know? Yeah, that that's the catalyst. We're recording this on September 7th, 2021 just four days away from the 20th anniversary. And this is the big reason why I wanted to, to talk to you. You had your book, Fool's Air and Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And uh, there was a, a brief Twitter discussion that I thought you could comment on before we get into the, the meat of Afghanistan of, you know, who opposed what and when. And I think if you go on the all-time record, it's undoubtedly Ron Paul, but in the actual votes, it was like Barbara Lee, you know, says no in, right. in the original kind of uh, oppositions. That, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that, like the initial no and the the authorization for the use of military force and, and that kind of uh, expansion, because it's a lot of weird stuff with even Bin Laden's history. You've already mentioned how he's been a pet of the intelligence agencies already, uh, so-called intelligence. But also, you know, he's, I think what kind of confuses people who lack the geographical knowledge is like, he's got some sort of Yemeni heritage, but I think he grew up in Saudi, but then he flees to Afghanistan. So it, it crosses like all these nations. And especially, you know, when you bring Pakistan in, it just gets confusing geographically and, and ethnically. Right. Okay. Well, first of all, on the authorization, um, you know, I put out a book, you can see it over my shoulder there for people watching the video version of this later. Uh, the great Ron Paul, it's the transcripts of all my interviews to Dr. Paul. And in fact, it's kind of annoying in there about how I bust his chops about this over and over and over again. Gee, Dr. Paul, how come you voted for the war in Afghanistan? <laughs> and then he says, listen, I didn't vote for the war in Afghanistan. And that authorization to use military force doesn't say anything about the war in Afghanistan. It says, get those that attacked us. And 
So, yeah, it was known at the time that that meant those people are in Afghanistan. But as you say, bin Laden was a Saudi. Al-Qaeda was all, you know, almost entirely Saudis and Egyptians. Maybe there's a few Chechens or something like that. But none of them were Afghans. And, um, but that's where they were. And in fact, you know, the original version of the AUMF that Cheney wanted had all kinds of expansive things in there about also we can blow up whoever we feel like. And the Democrats in the Senate took that out. Leahy and Daschle and Gephardt took that out. And so if you actually read the AUMF and if words mean what they say and the <laughs> law is the law, it doesn't say they can go hither and yon and do whatever they want. It, in fact, at one time, they were debating adding in the Obama years. They wanted to add the words and associated forces so that they could go after and lump in ISIS and lump in, you know, some guy who, you know, ever shook hands with Al-Shabaab somewhere or some kind of thing. But, and they never did that. But the point is that associated forces is not in there. It doesn't say in associated forces. It says the guys what did it them the guilty and whoever is harboring them which you know could have been extrapolated to mean the taliban um but not necessarily and um and i think ron paul honestly i wish that he hadn't voted for it and i think he should have stuck a hundred percent by his guns and and said that listen i'm all for bombing the guys that did it but this is too broad and it's going to be abused as a Gulf of Tonkin type resolution to go, you know, and, and what we need is something much more narrow, um, which he did introduce the, um, you know, proposed letters of mark and reprisal, which would have been bounties. And you wouldn't have to hire privateers. The point is that it's declarations that people always get the emphasis wrong here. You could hire mercenaries to go and collect mm -hmm. the bounty, but that isn't the point. The point is that's a declaration of war against a tiny little group, less than a state, like a ship full of pirates, something like that, which is yeah. what you had in Nangahar province at the time with Bin Laden and his group. It was a small band of bandits. You do a letter of mark and reprisal, pay the Delta Force. First Delta Force man brings me Bin Laden scalp, gets a billion dollar reward. Get out there, boys, and get the job done. But you're not allowed to kill innocent people. If you kill any innocent people, you go to jail. That's a crime. So shoot carefully, you know, but anybody gets in between you and bin Laden is fair game. But, you know, that would be within Congress's war power to do. And and Ron Paul actually issued those. I mean, he actually introduced those. Um, and of course, you know, was shouted down about that. But Barbara Lee deserves a lot of credit. She was the only member of the House or the Senate to say, I'm not going to vote for this thing. I cannot stand by this thing. And it's going to be abused. And it's too soon and it's too broad and everybody should calm down and we should, you know, rewrite this and we should have a, a, an investigation first and whatever. I forgot her entire speech there, but I think she invoked the Gulf of Tonkin and said that, you know, this is just, uh, you know, this is like that and that kind of thing. And I wonder if Ron and look, I, I, I don't think it was a political calculation on his part. Mm -hmm. I think, he thought, you know, at 3000 dead. Something yeah. absolutely has to be done about that. And yes, they were putting him in the position of this is the only choice of the bill that you have to vote up or down on. And he couldn't bear to let that go with a no vote. Um, you know, I don't think there was a political calculation on his part. I think it was an honest one from his own point of view. However, I think he I know he was conflicted. You know, I know he knew that it was going to be, you know, a problem, but he felt he had to do it anyway. Right. Um, but I think if he had voted no with her and then had just gone straight home to Galveston and just explained to everybody, look, man, you know me, this is why I did it because the constitutional principle and James Madison said, and all of that stuff, I think he'd have been okay, man. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he, he did face reelection in, you know, only uh, six weeks after that. But you know what? Even if he'd gotten thrown out, he'd have been back in two years. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's Ron Paul, man. He delivered two thirds of that district is or something they i don't i think he'd have been okay but and but got I, them um, out of social security in the 70s i'm sorry he also got galveston is like if i'm not mistaken the only county in the united states that seceded from social security sometime in the 70s and they just sort of allowed that to happen only for that 
area, and I'm I'm pretty sure he had something okay, to do you with have that. To send me a link about that. I want to yeah. know more about that. Um, that'd be great. Um, but um, so yeah, um, that that was the nature of the vote there. It is true. Barbara Lee is uh, she's the only one who voted against it. Although, you know, I have to say she's been pretty much a wall this entire time, as far mm -hmm. as I know. Maybe she does like some rallies and speeches and stuff, but um. Uh, I can't say I know her to be like a very active person in the anti-war movement, which is too bad because she ought to be wearing this huge badge of honor as like her most, you know, her greatest accomplishment of her life and and of her career that she made the right call there. Here we are 20 years later. Who could argue with her now? Um, yeah. In, in college, I studied Jeanette Rankin, who was the the only uh, no vote in World War One and World War Two, and she got kicked out for it. But yeah, I think to your point, she kind of had this uh, initial greatness and, and you know, exited stage left, whereas Ron Paul, um, you know, he was never this sort of dogmatic pacifist. He was going, like you said, for a surgical maneuver from laws that were originally established to hunt down pirates, like you said, not large, you know, nation states right. and, and certainly not a global war on terror. And he's been crusading against the war ever since then, right? I mean, I don't know when mm -hmm. his first anti-war speech was, but I bet it would have been before January of 02. I bet it was already, you know, in December. Okay, you let him get away. War's over. Come home. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know when the first one was, but I know that certainly when I was started reading uh, antiwar.com again, he was already there. They were already publishing all of his articles there. And, and he was, you know, one of the best. He didn't just vote no on Iraq. He was great on iraq you know he crusaded against the iraq war and did you know as much as he could get great speeches well, four or five or or six great house speeches about it and all this um so and and it's been of course great through the rest of his house career and his presidential campaigns he got millions of people you know i always like to emphasize this point about ron paul is what he was saying essentially by being a Republican white guy from Texas, like George W. Bush and all that, and having such a hardcore anti-war position. What he was essentially saying was, it's okay for you to change your mind about this stuff, right? You don't have to move left. You have to change your mind. You certainly don't have to change your identity from one thing into another. You can still be you. You just don't have to believe in this BS anymore. Cause come on, man, who could believe in this stuff? By 2008, you know, come on. Uh, we won the war in Iraq for guys who hate us and told us to get the hell out. Yeah, okay. You know, um, and so, and millions, I mean, he, he really changed the face of America. He didn't necessarily bring all the wars to an end, but he certainly got the ball rolling on turning the entire right wing against imperialism and against intervention in other countries. So, well, yeah, and the I, entire right wing, <laughs> much of it. He he made it legitimate, like you said, and yeah. and I was definitely on the left, and he gave me permission to listen to Republicans and conservatives who would be anti-war because I had those positions. As I said, I was at that point four or five years deep into uh, my immortal technique records, um, and here I am waiting to hear this, you know, warmongering and the most anti-war guy on the stage <laughs> in the Republican debates of 07, 08 was Ron Paul on the on the left and the democrats who was a it was a mike gravel and dennis kucinich so right. you know they had two and there was one on the other side but it was uh you know he opened that up to me to then continue to see that like you said it's a it's a multi-pronged or multi-ideological uh, critique against the the global american empire and it you know doesn't have to be that you give up on any of your economic views or so, civil liberty views. I I think it was um, great someone like Glenn Greenwald and someone as disparate from him as the comedian Cat Williams both understood the, these points that you've been highlighting. I, I saw from the comedy at the time. I think it was one of Cat Williams' first specials where he had this whole line about insurgents. We don't even know any of them, and you know people going to hit the pot. And say, yeah, go ahead and kill all of them. But you know, he's using humor to show the ridiculousness of the expanding definition. And you have Glenn Greenwald um, talking about how they're defining a militant as anyone between the ages of 16 and like 60 
uh, whether they had a gun or not, and they're male in in right. these areas, which is all over the world, you know, all over Central Asia, the Horn of Africa, and and anywhere. And yet, if you were to, you know, ask these people what they think about bringing the gold standard back or something like that, I don't think Cat Williams or Glenn Greenwald care about that much at all. No, unfortunately not. No, that Cat Williams bit is great. He says, uh, tell me what the Iraqi army uniform, this is from 08. Tell me what the Iraqi army uniform looks like. Right. You ain't never seen it because we ain't killing their army. <laughs> We're killing them. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that is kind of different, huh? Um, you know, on inflation, on, you know, gold money, I got a thing today. Um, I signed up for a sub scrap for a uh, sub stack of a leftist that I really like. And he is, you know, an all the way leftist Marxist, you know, slash something, I guess, dash something. <laughs> um, and he had this great article about the labor shortage as the media characterizes it and how, uh, you know, they got to cut off all the unemployment benefits and they're going to do, of course, he's absolutely against that. And they're going to do so uh, in part because the media has played this role this in this propaganda campaign of saying that there's a labor shortage, labor shortage, labor shortage. And it's all because there's too much unemployment insurance, too much unemployment insurance. And then he goes through, you know, just this endless list of articles and propaganda like this, especially at CNN. He found like 15 articles like that at CNN or something. And all this stuff is obviously coming from the Chamber of Commerce, where they're essentially, you know, the business lobby getting hooked up with the media, hooking themselves up with the media and doing this PR campaign to get the unemployment benefits cut so they can get people back in there. So obviously knowing a thing or two about economics, paying people to not work, obviously there's a disincentive to work there, right? I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. There's some examples. I'm sure he'd admit it too, but he's totally right that they never say. The problem is these businesses need to raise their wages. If they have heightened demand for labor, maybe they need to pay more, right? And so, and then he talks about how they do touch on that occasionally. It'll get mentioned, but it's mostly as he puts it a non sequitur. And then they go right back to there's just too much damn unemployment insurance. That's what the problem is, right? And I'm totally agreeing with this entire article all the way through. What can you say? He's just right about it, right? But then he totally missed the part of how come prices are going up so high and so quickly. And why is it that $15 an hour from a few years ago won't buy you mm -hmm. today what it would buy you then? And in fact, there's even, not that he's a Democrat, but there's a definitely anti-right and anti-business partisan angle here for him too, if he wants which is it was Donald Trump in conspiracy with the Federal Reserve who created all this new money in order to make up for the lockdowns last year and, and funneled it all to big business, right? And, and, you know, kept interest rates so artificially low. And we see the same thing with, um, they call it shrinkflation, right? Where your soda gets a little smaller. I remember when I was a kid, you can't do that on television, had a joke about how, my chocolate bar is like 50% foil now. I got to take off all this foil just to get to the chocolate bar. And the chocolate bar gets smaller and smaller and smaller for the same price because they can't just keep, you know, the company selling stuff to you. They can't just keep jacking up the prices all the time. They'll cut down on the quantity size just a little bit to save without raising the price or maybe while raising the price at the same time and try to split the difference to not scare all their customers away, right? So... Now, you can say they suck for doing that, but why are they doing that? You know, why is McDonald's needing to raise wages to get people in the door? It's because the value of the dollar has gone down. And why has the value of the dollar gone down? It's because the government's been counterfeiting money to give it to their friends. Then you have, of course, the lockdown policies, which have been driving hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people out of blue states and into red ones, where then they all go straight to the cities and drive, you know, there's no way in the world that the markets can make up for the increased demand on housing. 
And while, by the way, while money is essentially free for people with good credit to get it, especially say if you're BlackRock, you know, Wall Street investment firm, you know, I just read a thing about how single family homes, Wall Street never invests in those. There are no major companies, like you have major apartment corporations that build massive apartment complexes all across the country, right? There's like 20 of them or something. I don't know. But there are no companies that do that with houses that buy up single family, you know, you know, major firms that buy up huge tracts of single family homes and then, you know, to rent them out and that kind of thing. That's a brand new phenomenon. And it's because they got all this free money and they got nowhere to park it where they can get a return. And then yet there's this huge artificially created massive new demand in property. So they dump it all in property and drive the bubble up even higher. And so now try being a wage earner at a restaurant and pay the rent when they just added three, four, five, six hundred or more dollars a month to your rent. You're totally screwed. You cannot work for even 15, $20 an hour and make it. I mean, you can't. Um, so anyway, so that's the thing of it. And you see this from leftists and right wingers all the time too. great arguments. But they forgot to end up with the gold standard at the end of the article. That's why we need hard money. In fact, it's why hard leftist communists, if they're, you know, Machiavellian about it, it's why they like inflation because it destroys savings. It makes, you know, it disrupts the economy. It sharpens the divisions between those who own the biggest businesses and everybody else, right? It undermines the middle class, makes more poor people, you know, ripe for the revolution against the rich. And so... But if you really just care about poor people and working people and middle class people, you need hard money. It's hard money that's causing this not just massive price inflation, but cause the massive bubbles that lead to the massive crashes like we saw in 08. And, and you know, we had the crash from the lockdowns last year, but we were due for one anyway. The lockdowns just caused the crashing of the bubble that was already due to pop. And then what they do? I mean, I read a thing and I'm not a, I'm a great anti-war guy when it comes to this stuff, but um. I read a thing, a couple of things that said something like they created, uh, was it two thirds of all the U S dollars ever created were created last year. Oh my God. So, you know, we're just seeing that, that doesn't lead to just widespread price inflation across the board, which we are seeing, but leads to huge bubbles in certain sectors and, and massive distortions in price discovery across the board, dislocations across the board. And so, and then boy, especially if you look at Reddit, but all over the internet, all over everywhere, who go, oh, F capitalism. I saw on Reddit today. My rent has just gone up from 800 a month to $1,800 a month. I'm out of my ass. What am I going to do? My lease is up. They just raised it. F capitalism. But it ain't private property ownership and free exchange that caused that. It's not your landlord is greedy. It's that he's got bills to pay too. He's got to raise your, your rent because so that he can pay his rising cost of living and doing business and the rest of it too. And, and, you know, it's just the renter is the, and the, and the, the, uh, especially the restaurant employee wage earner, they're just the ones at the very end of the chain, you know, the last ones to get the S end of the stick, so to speak, you know? So anyway, all I'm saying is I totally agree with my commie friend. Just, I wish that he hated central banking and inflation. But then yeah. if he became a gold standard guy, then I don't know what all that would wreck of the rest of the things he believes, but, you know. <laughs> he could still believe in those other things, but the costs would just be more real. Like you could have a full-blown right. welfare state with it. But like you said, the costs would be upfront and honest. And if the costs of the war in Afghanistan were upfront and honest, that would probably rile enough people to be against it earlier on. Yep. Yeah, totally right. Um, and and listen, I mean, I think that's a huge part of the story of, I mean, really even World War One, but certainly the post World War Two era. I mean, Korea they did on a balanced budget somehow. I don't know, but for Vietnam they inflated, and leading to a bubble and a massive crash. And then what they do? They inflated some more through the 1970s. What was all the stagflation, as they called it then, an, an inflationary depression all through the 70s and they raised the interest rates through the roof crashed that inflationary bubble 
and then started up a brand new one again in like 83, 84 um, for the re-election of Reagan. And then, you know, to essentially disguise the cost of all that military buildup from the Reagan years. As he's cutting taxes as he's expanding military spending and making it seem like it's free by holding down interest rates artificially low to cause that giant bubble. Then they did the same thing in the uh and um during bush senior they caused a bubble that then popped after iraq war one they didn't raise taxes to pay for iraq war one at all and then we're supposed to get our peace dividend they said and they did you know um decommission however you call it huge parts of the u.s army and air force that were just absolutely superfluous after the fall of the soviet union so they did cut back on a lot of defense spending but then they turned right around and started expanding it again for the entire global imperial expansion of the Bill Clinton years and NATO expansion all into um, Asia and, and I mean, pardon me, into Eastern Europe and uh, naval expansion. And of course, you know, the military footprint in Saudi Arabia and all of the rest of that, all through the Clinton years, they didn't raise taxes. All they did was inflate the money supply and that led to, of course, the giant bubble in the stock market and the dot coms, you know, NASDAQ and, and Dow and led to the giant crash of uh, 99 and 2000. And then when Bush came in, I don't know if you remember this, but when Bush came in, he goes, hey, it's the Clinton recession, Clinton recession. I just got here. Clinton recession already happened before me. That was true. It was the crash from the Clinton bubble, the Clinton recession. And what does Bush do? Bush and, and Alan Greenspan start printing money all over again and then when september 11th happens they hit where the financial district in downtown manhattan so here we're already in a recession and now we got airlines uh you know these major uh corporations and all of these financial firms on in new york have taken a hit we're due for a real recession but bush doesn't just want to go to afghanistan he wants at least another uh, one other major bonus war in iraq and to make it seem free he conspires with Alan Greenspan to hold down the interest rates and make money seem free. And so, you know, launched this massive, what, you know, six, seven trillion dollar Iraq War II. And then while giving people, sending people a $300 and $400 rebate check in the mail. And so it was your dividend from all the profit we're making off the Iraq War, right? Something like that. Or is he cutting taxes? He's giving you a dividend for all the money we're making. But meanwhile, it was all just debt and inflation. And then thank God too, it's only fair. And think of how unfair it would be otherwise too. It, but the crash happened in September 08 on Bush's watch still. Then there's no way you can blame this on the next guy that, you know, you can blame a lot on the next guy because what did the next guy do? Help hold interest rates all the way down, huge stimulus spending. QE one, two, three, four, whatever it was to inflate the next bubble. And in order to make all of his wars seem free, you know, Barack Obama didn't raise taxes either as he's expanding the war in Afghanistan and then moving on to Libya, on to Syria, on to Yemen, spreading so calm all throughout um, North Africa and West Africa, expanding NATO commitments in Europe, expanding the pivot to Asia and the uh, naval buildup in the uh, pacific new nuclear arms the f-35 and the literal combat ship and all of this stuff and how do they do it they do it by printing money by printing money and that's the bubble that remember donald trump was in a desperate race to get reelected before the bubble popped right but the governors popped it for him right they locked everything down and crashed the economy anyway so that was the bubble that was going to pop sooner or later here. They went ahead and crushed that bubble. And then, but now where are we at again? Brand new, starting off a whole brand new bubble. And, and here they want to spend an Iraq War II worth of money in one year on infrastructure, they call it, inside the United States, which means bailouts for the states and God knows what kind of, you know, crony corporate contracting corruption, further public-private partnerships, to, to drag our country further into despotism.
Yeah, it, and and the most bizarre stuff about Greenspan expanding all that 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 you said is that you know it's it's well documented. I think from the '60s on for a long time, he was himself a gold bug. Right. So I don't I don't know that that leans us or brings us back to the conspiracies. Like, did somebody get to him, or or did he just change his mind? Power and influence, man. Yeah. No, there's a great um, there's a I don't know if you can find it on YouTube anymore, but. There used to be a great clip of Ron Paul reading Greenspan to himself from <laughs> Ayn Rand's book, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. He has this I've great essay about the gold standard in there. And he says, in fact, I remember this anecdote. Uh, Ron Paul says, he, he reads all this brilliant stuff, and he says, that was written by you, Mr. Greenspan, back in 1967, something like that. And Greenspan's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And Ron says, so in what way have your views changed since then? You know, and he says, no, I still agree with every word of that. Unfortunately, however, my friends at the Federal Reserve disagree or my colleagues at the Federal Reserve disagree is what he said. And then that was it. That, yeah, of course, I still think that, but that's not my job. My job is printing money. Mm -hmm. And then look, here's the other irony of this. And this always goes without saying, and I don't know how many people know this, but I think that this is, I, I think this matters. His wife holds down the news spot every afternoon on MSNBC. Andrea Mitchell Greenspan mm -hmm. tells us the news. And it's, she's not on CNBC, but still, she was covering the crash and the so-called recovery from it. In 08 and 09 and 010 and this whole time. Does that sound right to you? That Alan Greenspan's wife gets to sit here and either cover or not cover the effect of his policies on this entire society, in fact, the entire planet when the crash came? Like, there are at least some cases where a judge has to step down because, hey, there's a conflict of interest in this case. My brother-in-law mm -hmm. is a major investor in that company in this lawsuit, right? I have to get out. Something. A recusal. Andrew Mitchell doesn't have to step down after her husband's bubble brings down the whole world. And she's already like 90 years old anyway. Just send her off on vacation. Let her go. We're having this conversation 13 years later. She's still got the job. It's just, you can't make this stuff up, man. Yeah, the the connection between the the fourth branch or the the fourth estate there is, it's uh too much in our face to to deny. So we we've, we've talked about the original kind of alleged purpose of a surgical removal of those that done it on September 11th and. That obviously, over time, was not what happened. What I mean, it it seems that Biden doing this really great thing of pulling out finally, uh, although he did delay it and and caused whatever you know shit show occurred uh, that people are trying to exploit to try to get us back in there and in, in, in some other way. It you know this thing that is the greatest thing he's done is the thing that 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 fourth branch or fourth estate hates the most that yep. they can't stand him for even though that they've been his life support over the past year year and a half to make sure that there was no second term for trump who you know aesthetically or or whatever they just they could not tolerate a second term of of trump and would have done right. you know anything to to stop that so what what is you know the your opponents scott's your, your opponents you know what is their best argument for not doing what biden uh, did you know is it is it guarding the poppy seeds like you know they want opium production controlled like what yeah. is it that they what is it that they say that would benefit you know not doing what he did and, and finally ending that war or at least pulling out um and, and showing and exposing the the paper tiger that was this artificial republic of Afghanistan to be replaced by the emirate of, of yeah. Afghanistan. Well, I mean, so the best argument is the safe haven myth argument, and it's not a very good one, but it says that, look, 
We've been there this whole time and it's prevented terrorist attacks from happening on our shores. Except that it hasn't, right? Nidal Hassan shot up Fort Hood before be deploying to Afghanistan. Omar Mateen shot up Orlando, the club over Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria, but Afghanistan was on the list. The Zarnaya brothers blew up the Boston Marathon uh, over Afghanistan. And um, I forget the San Bernardino massacre, I believe, mentioned Afghanistan. And then you have it was an Eritrean the... killed in the San Bernardino yeah. one. And I, I know uh, the children. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're you um, know, Eritreans and Ethiopians. Yeah. Um, and then there was, um, I'm really sorry to hear that, man. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I, what was I going to say? Um, you were naming the massacres oh, uh, that uh, were not Pensacola. prevented. Yeah, Corpus Christi and Pensacola. Um, I'm pretty sure both of them invoked Afghanistan as well. Uh, and those were Saudis that shot up uh, naval air stations there. Um, so we do have reprisal attacks from the war in Afghanistan. That hasn't been on the scale of September 11th, but could have been. And some of these massacres have been, you know, really bad. If you look at especially Omar Mateen and, uh, uh, and, and Fort Hood and some of these. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, how many people did you say were killed in San Bernardino again? Uh, I don't I don't recall how many people oh. it, it was. It was just a person. I remember the, the the Ethiopian and the Eritrean community. It really stuck out because they they personally knew one of the people, and it's like you know yeah. this guy had nothing to do with any of that stuff. Yeah, but you know not. that's the nature yeah. of terror attacks. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So so that's the first thing. Is it well, wage and war of theirs kept us from being attacked here? No, it hasn't. It's motivated terrorist attacks here. That's the exact opposite of that. Okay. So that argument is over defeated and won secondly they say well but by having our troops there we could prevent further attacks from being launched from there because it'll be a safe haven if we leave and then al-qaeda will attack us again but this presupposes all kinds of wrong things first of all it says that occupation is the solution to terrorism when occupation is the cause of terrorism in the first place you know lindsey graham famously said yeah, but we weren't occupying Afghanistan before September 11th. Yeah, stupid. That's because we were busy occupying Saudi Arabia when we were attacked by Saudis on September 11th, man, and supporting the dictatorship in Egypt where we also had troops stationed um, uh, while these Saudis and Egyptians attacked us, not Afghans. So it was occupation that caused the, you know, Egyptian Islamic Jihad and, and Al-Qaeda war against the United States in the first place. Um, and then secondly, there's nothing magical about Afghanistan. If anything, to give them credit, it's remote and it's hard to get your guys there and it's hard to hit targets there. If there's somebody there that you really need to kill, they're pretty far away and it'd be easier to reach out and touch them if you already had an airbase there or something like that. Fine. That's not a convincing argument, and it it presumes that you have good enough intelligence about who you want to kill there and all those things in the first place. Um, but secondly, it presumes that what there's some kind of magic portal from Nangarhar Province to the Boston Logan Airport. When that's not the deal, right? What happened was the reason the September 11th hijackers were successful was that they were Egyptian engineering students studying in Germany. They were able to get visas and get entry into the United States. Some of them were here for a year and a half almost. Um, you know, many of them for uh, more than a year um, uh, in the country. And they planned the attack in California and Arizona and Florida and South Carolina and Maryland and New Jersey. And in fact, in Maryland, they were actually buying their airline tickets on the payphone at the Safeway, just down the street from NSA headquarters on a Saturday, when, as James Bamford writes, that Safeway had to absolutely have been packed with NSA officers and their wives in there doing their shopping and walking right by Mohammed Atta on the phone outside, who General Michael Hayden was the head of NSA and was in charge of surveilling, and of course, this guy was, they had all the reason in the world to think that he was a representative of, of a foreign terrorist group. So all they needed was a reasonable belief to track him and tap his phones wherever he went and all of those things. Not a probable cause like in a Fourth Amendment warrant, but um, a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act warrant. And so 
Uh, Michael Hayden completely dropped the ball on that. And these guys were able to literally buy their hijack tickets down the street, like essentially, you know, within uh, near within the line of sight of NSA headquarters. Um, and so, and then look at the Boston Marathon attack and Omar Mateen in, in um, Orlando and all the rest of these. You don't need a country to be a safe haven to launch these attacks. Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, came from England. Abdul Mutalab, uh, Mutalab, he was sent by Yemeni al-Qaeda, but he didn't need to be there. They could have arranged the whole thing on the internet anyway. And it was the Americans who intervened to let him into the country. This is the underpants bomber that almost blew up the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009. And if you're really concerned, you know, another major point there, you're really concerned about that one. Well, look who sent him. It was AQAP. At the time, Obama was already bombing them before they sent this guy to blow up a plane over Detroit. Then, a few years later, he switched sides. And America's been fighting for AQAP against their Houthi enemies in Yemen ever since March of 2015, for more than six years now. We've been on AQAP's side. The other major, other than Yemen, the other major al-Qaeda safe haven in the world is in the Idlib province in Syria, where America's allies, the Turks, protect them from the Syrian government and the Russians from coming in and cleaning them out. Um, and in Afghanistan, ISIS there are the enemies of the Taliban, who with American help killed the hell out of them back in 2019, 2020, and you know pretty much destroyed their organization. They have every interest in the world in destroying uh, ISIS in Afghanistan. And then people claim that the Taliban are still friends with Al-Qaeda and they're going to let Al-Qaeda come back. But I think that there's the evidence for that is very thin. Um, you know, constantly the hawks like, well, it says in UN reports. Well, isn't that suspicious immediately? UN reports. Like, why not the CIA said to the New York Times? You gotta <laughs> give me UN reports, you know? So then you go read the UN reports and they don't say anything. Well, member states tell us this is true. Oh, really, huh? And then that's it. And tell us what is true. They don't say. Just Al-Qaeda's in Afghanistan. Oh, okay. No evidence presented, no details, no data whatsoever. Um, so those UN reports are hot air. They're nothing. You can't stand on that at all. Then you have some reports in Reuters that say, well, there's AQIS. Huh? Oh, Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. Uh-huh. In other words, Pakistanis being used in Kashmir against the Indians. Sounds like somebody else's problem to me. Call them Al-Qaeda doesn't mean anything there. Does that have anything to do with Bin Ladenite international Arab terrorism against the West? No, not at all. Um, and then the other day they said, oh, look, this guy, he's Al-Qaeda. He came back from Pakistan to the Nangahar province. See, Taliban loves Al-Qaeda. But then actually read the story. The guy's a Pashtun from the Nangahar province. They say that he used to be close with bin Laden, but he's not a Saudi. He's not an international jihadist. He was, you know, apparently like a, a, a kind of middleman between Al-Qaeda and the Taliban back then, 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean anything, really. You know, it, it, I guess you could give him half points for that or something. I don't know. Um, but, uh you know, and then they say that the Haqqanis are still friends with Al-Qaeda and the Haqqanis are part of the Taliban. Well, that's true. Jalaluddin Haqqani is gone and his son, Sirajuddin, I think they just named him defense minister. Did I read that right? They So <laughs> Haqqani's son is has a major cabinet position. I forgot. I think it's defense minister. I just barely read a little bit about this today. They just announced today the, form, the, you know, the members of their new cabinet there. Um, for the new so regime. Yeah, but what's the evidence that the Haqqanis have stayed very close to Al-Qaeda this whole time? I haven't seen it. And what's the evidence that they're going to bring a bunch of Al-Qaeda guys back to Afghanistan now? I mean, look, man, don't get me wrong. The, uh, the uh, Taliban guys are ruthless. And they're shameless. And they make really bad decisions sometimes. But, man, would they be damned fools to let Al-Qaeda come back to Afghanistan now. There's just no reason in the world to do that. And especially when the Americans are in a position where they're not going to invade again, but they might just come and carpet bomb you out of anger and frustration, right? In a way that 
what does it gain them? So I guess we'll see. I'm not, you know, I don't want to predict and I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. vouching for the Taliban. I'm just saying they would be damned fools to go ahead and make the kind of deal that they had made before to allow these guys one to be in their country, to stay in their country at all, but especially to organize attacks against outside powers. You know, the Taliban are not Al Qaeda. They're not bent on world revolution. They're not bent on spreading the caliphate and all of this crap. They want revolution in one country and they just want it. In fact, today they finished apparently wrapping up in the Panjshir Valley and they control the entire country now. So now they want to bite off a whole new war against the West after they just won one? I don't think so. Yeah, and this is more restoration than it is revolution of this 20-year artificial aberration. And it's it's fast, most fascinating and ironic that we started, when we're talking about the AUMF, talking about how America, at least the regime of America, is supposed to get in there and perform this surgical strike in this organized orderly fashion which doesn't mean that it's it's bloodless you know but you know there would be blood like you said you know billion dollar bounties for kind of you know, navy seals and other special forces but that's not what happens instead you get sort of chaotic violence over the years and then you expect the the afghan regime to come in with all this bloody chaotic violence and they're not coming in as peaceniks, you know, they're not hippies, but they come in and, and they're, they are killing people. You've mentioned that elsewhere, you know, they are yep. coming in and killing who done it, meaning who was, you know, the, the people in charge of who got rid of them. Uh, but for the most part, they're not, you know, unleashing wanton violence upon, upon their own Afghan people of various uh, ethnicities and, and tribes. And they're just know, saying, get out of the way. And, there, you know, there definitely have been some revenge killings and stuff like that, but they have declared an official amnesty for everybody who was part of the last government. So they're not just taking everybody out and shooting them. I mean, there, you know, there have been, I think, relatively, you know, you can even say very few examples of that uh, compared to how bad it could be. And I think that was part of the panic was the idea was that they were the Khmer Rouge and they were just going to kill everybody or something like that. But it's just not the case. And, you know, people were mad because I was, I said on the Tom Woods show, I think the day of, or maybe the day after people were hanging on to the side of the plane and then falling out of the sky. And I was saying, just wait for the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, I understand people are afraid and they're panicking. And when other people around you are panicking, then you think maybe they must have reason to or something. And, you know, mobs aren't very intelligent, but sit back, relax, have some crackers there's another plane coming. You can get on that one. And people got really mad at me for saying that. But then another 100,000 people were evacuated after I said that. So the idea that the Taliban were coming over the walls like um, World War Z or whatever that was, that was, that was called. Yeah, the zombie the one, zombies. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't like that. The Taliban had to deal with the Americans to provide security. And then you know, when the suicide bomb went off, a bunch of people on Twitter said, ha, oh, I told you so. You're so stupid. You said the Taliban wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, a bunch of people who don't know anything about the war in Afghanistan at all are the ones telling me that. And none of them said, oh, I guess you're right. Sorry. When, of course, it came out, you know, moments later and from then on that it wasn't the Taliban who did that, dummy. It was the Islamic State, you know, wannabes there that did that. And the Taliban had tried to prevent it. And, and so, again, um, you know, just the facts. I'm not trying to be a partisan on their side or whatever, but I'm just saying they had clearly made the decision that they would rather be clever than cruel this time. They're going to, the Americans want to leave. Let's help them leave. There's no reason to be a giant pain in their ass on the way out the door. You know, go ahead and sayonara and all of that. And so that was what was going on. So, and seriously. Another 100,000 people were removed, which is not to not criticize them because, man, they botched that whole thing and they did leave at least hundreds of Americans behind, which is just unforgivable and should be unexplainable. In fact, I read a thing at Politico. I don't know if you saw this. Man, there's such great stuff by Peter Van Buren at the American Conservative lately. He's written three or four great ones in a row in Afghanistan now. And he links to the thing at Politico about how the suicide bombing, they knew there was a suicide bombing coming. They had all this intel about it. And they wanted to close the Abbey Gate, it's called. 
where all the Americans and others were congregated, but they left it open for the Brits. And the Brits had a group of people coming from a hotel and they kept that gate open extra longer, you know, extra long for them. And that was, and then the suicide bomb went off and killed a dozen American servicemen. And then, you know, also more than a hundred bystanders were also killed in that. Some of them apparently were massacred and shot to death by the CIA's militia guards who were standing on top of the wall and just opened fire into the crowd after the bomb went off. Um, I don't know if that's confirmed, but it seems to be. There are multiple reports of that. So, yeah, I mean, it was absolute disaster the way that they, well, it wasn't an absolute disaster. It was pretty damn screwed up. But it could have been way worse if the people's fears had been real about what the Taliban were interested in doing there. But I, I don't know who originally said this. I guess I need to Google it because I keep quoting it. But the radical becomes conservative the day he seizes the capital city. So, you know, what need does uh, Hassan Akhanzada have to try to take over the world now when he's just taken over Afghanistan? You know what I mean? What's he going to do? He's going to move on the Ayatollah in Tehran? Is that who's next? He's going to roll into uh, Karachi and Islamabad and seize Pakistan? I think he's probably good where he's at. You know? Yeah, and then he'd have to deal with taking over China and Russia before he got over to America. Yeah, he'd have to secure Asia. Yeah, exactly. And I was threatened recently uh, by a certain debate opponent that if we don't run the world, then China or Iran or Saudi Arabia could take it over in our place. Yeah, I'm not that worried about that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I think we're a long way from that and and blessed by the, the two oceans on, on each side of us geographically. Uh, not not to say, you know, the people, the, the governance structures that have been built here and and uh, the elites from all over the world that have been brain drained into uh, America, you know, which, you know, I'm a I'm a child of a couple <laughs> from the '70s, so uh, you know, it's uh, it's a, a hat tip, but not a blank check, nor a full endorsement to uh, the Taliban and Joe Biden for figuring this out finally. Um, you know, I, I know on another note, a couple people have been asking you to comment on the 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 ongoing war in uh, Ethiopia and I know you had said that you hadn't looked into it enough yet to 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 comment but I think what we could do to uh to uh lean into your expertise is talk about some of the things that that have been going on because I've read for years there for example uh, although they said they got rid of it but the drone base they used to have in in Arba Minch, which is near the southern border of Ethiopia to fight Al Shabaab, which is another, you know, Al Qaeda affiliate in Somalia, and what I think a lot of people don't even realize on a basic level, and I try to remind people, Somalia is not a failed state. It's like five failed states. You know, uh, the the whole eastern region of Ethiopia is called the Somali region of Ethiopia, and they're ethnic Somalis. They have the same Islamic religion, the same food, the same languages. The eastern part of Djibouti are all ethnic Somalis, the Isa. And then you've got the three different ones, the, the Mogadishu, the, the Puntland, and the Somaliland. Like it's it's a it's a mess there. But any anything you can tell us about the the war on terror as it as it's been in, in the Horn of Africa, either in relation to using the Red Sea to uh, against Yemen or in Somalia or anything in Ethiopia, sure. I think a lot of our, our audience would appreciate that. Yeah, well, I mean, I have a whole chapter on the Somalia war in enough already, the new book. As far as, you know, the current problems going on in, in Ethiopia with the Tigray and all that, um, I'm hearing a lot of stories of atrocities that pretty much all go one way. And I'm always really reluctant to, you know, climb on board for things like that because a lot of times those things don't pan out uh, the way that, you know, they're originally explained. Although, um, you know, I guess I do understand, though, that the Tigray used to be the dominant faction there until relatively recently. And now they're caught between their enemies who now control the capital city and, and the national government and the Eritreans who also hate them for their, you know, previous wars and all of that. But um, the reason I've been reluctant to talk too much about it is just because 
there's so much going on, especially with Afghanistan and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm way behind it on it. I mean, I really need to stop and just spend days and days reading just everything I can in the world about it uh, to try to really figure out what I believe is going on there and especially what role any countries in the West have in, um, you know, perpetuating the thing or or anything like what, that. What I can say, and it's been really Go difficult ahead. for Ethiopian Americans who are generally Democrats and generally progressive to understand because they're usually more interested in domestic stuff than foreign policy. And one of the big yeah. things they don't understand is that the whole apparatus that we've been talking about this whole time, and especially in the time of Obama and uh, Biden, who was his number two man, uh, were allied with the Tigrayan military forces, which have many different names, TPLF, TDF, whatever. They started off as Marxist and then became whatever it is they are now, and now they're relegated to a region. So it's, uh, you know, Trump had threatened to blow up a dam that was getting built in Ethiopia because of certain things. But you know what? Trump says a lot of things. But in general, I, from my take, is that Trump kind of looked the other way. Whereas before Trump, all the other people were keenly there and allied. And when Trump looked the other way for a couple seconds, there was a, a natural sort of regime change that took place. And the TPLF were relegated to a regional state because while they were running the country for 27 years, they were running the country because the whole country, including Eritrea, had been together allied with the TPLF to get rid of the communists that had overthrown the, right. the Ethiopian empire, which was a Christian monarchy. So the right. only reason they were given the reins of power in the first place was to get rid of the communists. And then it turned out that, you know, they had their own issues, even if it wasn't, you know, outright communism. Right. Um, and then, you know, I remember reading Raimondo back 10, 15 years ago or some 10 years ago, at least about the Tigray persecution of the Amoro. And I guess they're the ones who are in charge now, right? Yeah, it's a it's a mixed bunch now. The the guy now he's a um, he I think identifies mostly with Oromo, but I mean it's just the the lines between some of these ethnicities, especially in in the large cities, is is pretty ridiculous. Yeah. And the guy himself, he speaks the Oromo language, he speaks the Amharic language, which is the official language, and he speaks Tigrinya as well. And he you know he does speeches in Tigrinya, which is spoken by both the Tigrayans and the people of Eritrea. The, the people of Eritrea and the Tigrayans are actually the most similar, you know, genetically, ethnically, linguistically, too. So it's it's just even, not politically. You know, I got yeah, it. just not politically, yeah. not a politically at yeah. all. All right. Well, listen. I mean, I'm way behind on that, but um, you know, I'm certainly interested in whatever you have. If you want to send me stuff to read and and uh, all that kind of thing, I'll try to catch up on it. I mean, what I know about yeah, the Somalia War that. is basically what happened was there were according to the fbi there were three guys wanted for questioning for participation in the um coal attack and the africa embassy attacks and so there's you know like this scant you know supposed al-qaeda presence there so in december 01 you know, at the time when they should have been ending the terror war, they're already expanding it to Somalia. It's Bush that sends JSOC and CIA there. And what they do is they make friends, I think almost immediately, with the son of uh, Mohammed al Adid, who had been, I think that was his first name, uh, al Adid, who had been the warlord bad guy during Black Hawk Down, who was seizing all the foodstuffs and all that that caused the Americans to then go try to arrest him. And then with the crash of the Black Hawk helicopter and the Rangers and Delta guys killed and all that catastrophe. Well, they went and found his son and said, hey, man, we'll give you money and guns and, and a, a few other warlords, too. We'll give you money and guns if you'll hunt and kill Islamists for us. And then they said, OK, sure. And then, of course, they went out and hunted and killed whoever they wanted okay. and were aggrandizing their own power. And the more they did so, the more people resisted against them. And, oh, I should mention at this point, too, um, that, you know, the communist regime had fallen. The Bari regime, which was an American-backed communist regime in the Cold War days because the Ethiopians were backed by the Soviets. So <laughs> America backed the communists in Somalia. But Bari had fallen in 91. 
And then the whole country was essentially, you know, divided up by warring warlords and so forth throughout the 1990s. And yet by like, I guess, 98 and, you know, right around the turn of the century there, all the warlords essentially had been exhausted. And no one was dominant. They all had essentially been relegated to their, you know, local counties, their, you know, small little areas. And in, you know, during this time, it was essentially an anarchist country. There was no one in charge. And the economy was doing great. And libertarians noticed. And when you hear the refrain now that, oh, you think freedom works so well, or you think libertarianism works so well, why don't you move to Somalia? This is where that comes from, is there were American libertarians at George Mason University and in Liberty Magazine and other places who noticed that, look, they don't have a doctrine of libertarian capitalism. They just have it by default here because there's no state. The last warlords were, had basically put themselves out of business. And there's no one to collect taxes at the ports of Mogadishu or Kismayo. And the economy's doing great. The cell phone industry, which is the major marker, um, you know, then as it is now, I guess, was doing better than anywhere else in sub-Saharan Africa, I think was the report at the time. And it was just, you know, a boom time for Somalia. And then, um, so then the Americans came and when they started supporting these warlords, the locals started resisting them. And the more they resisted them, the more the warlords came back to the CIA and said, they're all a bunch of Islamist bin Ladenite terrorists. We need more money and more guns. And then the more they would persecute the people, the more the people fought back. And this went on through a cycle through till about 2005 when 13 disparate groups from, you know, excluding Somaliland and Puntland and obviously excluding Far Eastern uh, Ethiopia, as you mentioned there, but um, from, you know, essentially Mogadishu all the way south, uh, you had all these disparate groups, 13 disparate groups come and join together and form the Islamic Courts Union as a government and with an armed force to drive the militias, the the um, American back warlord militias out of the country. And they did so and drove them into Ethiopia. And that was, I think, about uh, by the end of 05. And then they were trying to essentially put their government, you know, together through 06. But by Christmas 06, W. Bush struck a deal with the uh, leaders in Ethiopia to have the Ethiopians invade. And they were backed by the Special Operations Forces and CIA during the invasion. So there's no question about that. The, the Americans were involved, you know, on the ground level and in the air and all the way through with that invasion in Christmas 06. And they did succeed in smashing the Islamic Courts Union. But then the the smallest and weakest and you know least important part of the Islamic Courts Union, the youth, Al-Shabaab, had, which actually someone told me it's actually the boys is a better translation. <laughs> the boys, Al-Shabaab, look, their job was sitting there quiet while the uncles and the elders and the imams and the grandpas, you know, and, and the, the people in the, the, the elders of the community decided what to do. But once the Ethiopians invaded, well, who picks up the rifle and does the fighting? The boys. Mm -hmm. And so Al-Shabaab now is the reason we're there, don't you know? We got to fight Al-Shabaab. But Al-Shabaab was invented as a problem for the Americans a full six years into their intervention was when Al-Shabaab even picked up their rifle and squeezed off their first bullets. And so um, then, you know, the guy, uh, uh, by the way, when the Bush government was out of time in 08, Condoleezza Rice made a deal with the former leader of the Islamic Courts Union, a guy named Sheikh Sharif. I forgot all his first names. He's got a bunch of first names, but Sheikh Sharif. And Rice made a deal. Guess what? You can be the leader of the Somali government after all, but not the Islamic Courts Union. You'll have to be the leader of the new government that the U.S. and the U.N. have created for you, the transitional federal government. And he signed the deal. He said, okay, fine. And the State Department's in the WikiLeaks that where the State Department officials say, well, we felt it was better that we weakened him and we keep a weakened him back in and all that. So here we've had two years of bloody war and all these people killed. They're reinstalling the guy they overthrew. 
and saying, well, at least we took him down a peg, you know? Forgive me one sec. Um, and then so, um, and he stayed in power through 2012. Sharif did. Um, and then, you know, the wars raged this whole time. For, um, I'm going to say from 2010, I, I think like late 09, early 10 through 12, Al-Shabaab had seized and ruled the port city of Kismayo further south down the coast there mm -hmm. and had taken over the car, the charcoal industry um, and like black market charcoal, I guess, clear cutting and selling charcoal. And but then the Kenyans invaded in 2012 and kicked them out. And that was when they turned to the Saudis. And if they can get Saudi finance, then they can declare then they'll declare themselves Al Qaeda and go for you know a more expansive agenda and in fact they did attack um across borders into kenya and uh ethiopia they did terrorist attacks there although they were i think in both cases direct reprisal attacks um you know there was one where they bombed a bar where a bunch of guys were walking watching a soccer game in kenya um, and that got all the attention, but nobody said that the Kenyans had actually bombed a Somali soccer game and killed a bunch of people two weeks before, you know, you have to read antiwar.com day in and day out to know stuff like that, or, you know, you, you wouldn't catch it, but it was a direct reprisal for that. Um, but then there was a leader, one of the leaders of Al-Shabaab was a guy named Godain, or I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, but spelled like that. And he was killed in a drone strike, I think, in 2014 or 15 or something. And he was the guy who had the more internationalist agenda, if they, if anybody in Al-Shabaab could ever be said to have had one. And now he's been dead for a very long time. And then, so really, look, I got to say, man, that the parallel here with the, Somali, with the Somalia war and the Afghan war are perfect, right? Like in Iraq, they were fighting for the supermajority, mm -hmm. or at least the political factions of the supermajority. And once they put those guys in power, that worked. I mean, that the government that W. Bush installed in Baghdad is still there, right? In Afghanistan, that was never going to fly. In Afghanistan, they were trying to foist a coalition of minorities onto the plurality of the country, the, pl the plurality that don't mind fighting, you know? And that was just never going to fly. And it's the same kind of thing here where, you know, it's not, I don't know so much all the different ethnic sects inside Somalia or, you know, whatever, uh, those very small local divisions there. But essentially, the transitional federal government or whatever they call it now in Mogadishu, it does not have popular support. Not that no. people prefer Al-Shabaab necessarily, but they don't support the government that the U.S. has come and created for them. And there's no reason to believe whatsoever that I've ever heard of that the government in Mogadishu would survive if the U.S. and the AU, because it's backed by uh, Ethiopian, Kenyan, and Burundian troops as well, under the AU, <laughs> paid for by the U.S. I've never seen reason to believe that if international support was withdrawn, that there's any popular support for the government in Mogadishu that would help for it to survive. And so what happens after that? Hell if I know, but I don't care. It's not my business. And it's up for the people of Afghanistan to work it out. And um, you know, there's an expert named Bronwyn Bruton who's written about how in the 1990s, there was a group of bin Ladenites that popped their head up and nobody did anything about it, you know, internationally speaking. And the locals just took care of it. Nobody wanted to put mm -hmm. no crap on them. And they were quickly marginalized and replaced by local domestic, you know, parochial power sources. So that's it. Um, there's every reason to believe, just like with Afghanistan, there's no reason to believe that these people are going to what host what, like, again, there's a magic portal from Somalia to Boston Logan airport. And if, if America doesn't control a puppet government in Mogadishu, that somehow Somalia is going to become a safe haven for terrorist attacks against the United States as though it couldn't be used as one right now or this entire time. You know, America and their puppets, it's not like they've controlled the entire country of Somalia this whole time whatsoever. <laughs> so, um, you know, the war there is not preventing anyone from using it as a safe haven. If anything, it's motivating people. And I got to tell you, man, I think we're extremely lucky. I don't, I hate even saying this. I'm, I'm afraid to say this, honestly, but I'll say it. Um, there have been something like a dozen Somali Americans who have gone home to fight 
on Al-Shabaab's side in this war? And how lucky are we that none of them so far has decided to just stay here and participate in their side of the war here on our shores by crashing a gasoline truck into something or shooting somebody or doing some crazy thing, man. It's just, they hadn't thought of that. I don't know. Uh, but thank God. But that's the kind of fire that we're playing with. And there's a huge Somali diaspora inside the United States who yeah, ought to have cities. every reason. Yeah, they ought to have every reason in the world to be patriots and no reasons otherwise. And yet, you know, look at the Times Square bombing. That guy was a Pakistani American. He was married, had a kid, had a house, had an advanced degree and a job. I think he was an engineer. So he's making six figures. He go, He's living the American dream. He goes home to Pakistan. And he sees the results of an American drone strike. And he joins up the Pakistani Taliban that had never had beef with us before, had never attacked the United States before. And they taught him how to make a bomb. And thank goodness they didn't do a very good job of it um, because his bomb failed to detonate. But he tried to blow up Times Square and could have killed, you know, dozens at least of civilians if he had succeeded in that attempt. So, you know, in fact... In, in the, according to the Washington Post, Donald Trump said, why are we in Somalia? I don't want to be in Somalia. Why can't we just pull our troops out of Somalia? And James Mattis said, we're trying to prevent a Times Square attack. Yeah, but no, it's drone wars that cause Times Square attacks. We already know this. And if he was trying to get to confuse Trump into thinking Somalis had done that, well, that's just a bunch of crap. But if he's saying that it goes without saying that if you use drones in war to explode people to death, that that makes terrorist attacks against you not happen. But that ain't science, man. That's not true at all. And, you know, Stanley McChrystal used to say, oh, I don't think we should be doing these drones, man. This is really bad. You know how it looks to people where you don't even come to fight them face to face at all. In fact, you're not even sitting in the pilot seat of the plane bombing them. You're just sending robots to kill people. And the level of frustration and rage that that causes is not in America's interest, man. Not over the long term at all. And I quote in the book where um, I'm pretty sure it was Chuck Todd asked Leon Panetta on um, uh, Meet the Press, NBC Meet the Press on Sunday morning. He goes, look, man, we got all this evidence now that the drone war in Yemen is making matters worse. And people are wanting to join Al-Qaeda because of the drone war. So... What if all this is just counterproductive? And Panetta says, uh, ham, haw, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure. I don't know. But uh, ultimately, these are the tools that we use because these are the tools we have. So in other words, close enough for government work, dude. You know, I get to clock out of here and say I killed some terrorists today. If in seven years from now, somebody blows up something in the United States and they say it was revenge for something I did now, nah, well, then forget that. You know, who cares about that? No one will notice that. These are the tools we have. So these are the tools we use. Simple as that. Or it's a misparaphrase, but very close to that. Something like that, he said. Yeah, um, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's right. So, yeah, if you're a CIA director, you fly robots around murdering people. That's what you do. And then they, they can't see that. This is the kind of thing that gets us in this trouble in the first place. And that's why I wrote this book. And that's why the book starts in 79. Is, is like, that enough at, already? Yeah, enough already. Well, really both of them. But yeah, enough already mm -hmm. is, you know, look, every single look. And, and as we talk about the war all the way through, Somalia may be the only one where when I say AQAP, Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, Arar al-Sham, Abu Sayyaf out there in the Philippines, you name it. They all have their origins in the 80s Afghan war, man. They all do. Al-Shabaab might be the only one that doesn't out of all of them. And so that just comes up over and over and over again. This is all blowback. These guys worked for Carter and Reagan. Then Bush and Clinton pissed them off. Then Bush Jr. exploited their violence to make everything that much worse. And Obama tripled it. And here we are. That's the story, you know. So, you know, every bit of this. You couldn't bring up a single aspect of the terror war that doesn't have an important antecedent that you need to know to understand how it came to be this way. Can't talk about Al-Shabaab without talking about the fact 
that Bush sent CIA and JSOC to Somalia in 2001. And now Shabab became a problem in 2007. So let's talk about the chronology here. You know, people got to know that stuff. And and look, look at where we are now. And it seems like it should be a massive turning point in the country right now, right? Where everybody knows Iraq went absolutely to hell, the rise of the Islamic State and all that. Now you're telling me we lost Afghanistan and the Taliban took right back over the country again like it was nothing as we're headed out the door and all this. You got the round number really like of the change, the the flip of the odometer to 2020, where it's like a, it's official 2021 now. It's official that a generation has gone by. It's taken 20 years to kill 400 men and now we got 40,000. We wasted ten trillion dollars, and we killed two million people. And are you kidding me? Like what? People have got to be able to ask themselves why it's like this. You know what I mean? It it can't be that our government's job is keeping us safe, and that they're trying their best. You know, there's something else at play, and mostly it's money in Israel. But you knew that. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's funny, actually, some of the new political alliances, it almost reminds you of some of the reshaping of the map around World War One, because it's, uh -huh. um, and I'll try to send you some stuff after this, but Israel and now Turkey are actually helping Ethiopia and Eritrea right now reestablish yourself. It's, uh, everyone says thank you to the troops for all of this stuff that they're doing abroad but really i say thank you to scott horton for your service uh go buy his books buy fool's errand buy enough already buy the great ron paul and you'll see how consistent they have been on uh, all of these issues and you'll be well informed enough because if you get to know one of these areas really well i feel like it gives you a lens through which you can now sift through where you know the way you do you look at all the other news that don't have your perspective and yet you're able to see what they're missing just like you mentioned with the the substack when when we were talking earlier and i i hope we are able to get to a place where uh like you said americans wake up and we don't have to be the policemen of the world anymore and we go to a pre-world war one multipolar world and I, I think that's inevitable it's just a matter of how long it's it's going to take and you're obviously when this is all said and done going to be one of the heroes and in, in that in that war <laughs> in that information war to use the alex jones language so I, I i thank you so much um scott and please can you tell everyone in my audience um where they can find your books to purchase them and where else they can you know find you on twitter or or anywhere else online sure well thanks a lot for that man really appreciate that um the books are all at libertarianinstitute.org books uh, and that's, uh, as you said, the great Ron Paul fools, Aaron and enough already. And then I'm on the radio Sunday morning, uh, 8 30 KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. And, uh, I got the Scott Horton show 5,500 and something interviews going back to 2003 for you all at scotthorton.org and at youtube.com slash Scott Horton show. And I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute. I'm the editorial director of antiwar.com. And you can follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton show. Thank you so much, Scott. Hell yeah. Thank you for having me, man.